Could you do 107 facts about X-Men, the animated series? It's hard for us not to remember a time when the X-Men weren't considered one of the coolest superhero teams out there, but as it turns out, the early 90s were a vastly different landscape, and a superhero TV series wasn't the obvious crowd-pleaser that it is today. In 1992, X-Men the Animated Series was instrumental in spawning a huge superhero boom that's still continuing to this day. I'm Neil McNeil with Channel Frederator, and today we're exploring one of the most beloved animated superhero series of all time. Are you a die-hard fan or just wondering if it's worth a watch? Well, we've got something for everybody as we count down the 107 facts you should know about X-Men the Animated Series. Let's get started. Fact number one, X-Men the Animated Series debuted on Fox Kids on Halloween 1992 as part of their Saturday morning lineup. I guess you could say that anyone who dressed up as Wolverine that year was pretty on point. Number two, the X-Men made their first TV appearance in 1966 on the animated series The Marvel Superheroes as the Allies for Peace, which featured Angel, Beast, Cyclops, Iceman, and Marvel Girl. Number three, after not appearing on TV for the entirety of the 1970s, they would appear once again in 81 and 82 in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. Iceman was one of the aforementioned regularly occurring Amazing Friends, so plenty of the X-Men popped up from time to time as supporting cast. Number four, in 1989, the X-Men got their own cartoon, or at least tried to. The pilot for Pride of the X-Men wasn't picked up and nearly killed the team's chances at primetime. Apparently, among other things, the executives didn't like the Australian-accented Wolverine. However, I guess Australians with fake American accents are totally fine. Number five, as an interesting side note, the X-Men's co-creator Stan Lee provided the narration for the introduction of Pride of the X-Men, which was not used in the reworked Fox series. Number six, in 1991, Margaret Loesch, the executive producer of Pride of the X-Men, left Marvel Productions to become president of Fox Children's Network upon its inception. Once she gained the position, she immediately fought for an X-Men series done the right way basically moving away from the mindset that deemed it necessary to give Spider-Man amazing friends in the first place. Number seven, the anti-superhero sentiment was high in the 80s and early 90s, and Loesch really had to fight for pride. Loesch still remembers executives' harsh comments. Margaret, you have to stop pitching us these comic properties. Don't you understand that comics are read by 18-year-old nerdy boys and they'll be of no interest to anyone else? Number eight, as soon as the network's initial lineup was set, Loesch called up X-Men co-creator Stan Lee and said, okay, look, I couldn't sell it, but now I'm going to buy it. Loesch believed wholeheartedly in the series' potential and even gave the development crew all the extra time they needed, resulting in a bizarre at the time mid-season premiere. Number nine, Loesch said that she read into the X-Men a lot more than even Stan Lee did originally. When she introduced the cartoon at an advertising upfront meeting, she discussed how the characters represented the disenfranchised youth who always feel out of place and ill at ease. Stan Lee would go on to tell her, geez Maggie, I never thought of that. Number 10, Lotion Fox hired Eric Lewald as executive story editor. Lewald also came up with all of the show's story ideas. His past credits are incredibly endearing to any 90s kid, as they include Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, Tailspin, and the cartoon Beetlejuice. Number 11, Sidney Awanter, VP of Fox Kids and executive director of the X-Men series, sold Lewald to Loesch. Lewald had gained favor with Awanter after editing 20 Beetlejuice scripts. So remember kids, any menial-ish jobs that you may be offered will definitely pay off. Hashtag X-Men lessons. Number 12, early on, Lee himself expressed interest in running the show. However, he wanted the teenage vibe from his original comic in the 60s, while Loesch, Iwanter, and Luwald envisioned the animated series drawing from the intensity of the post-Lee 70s comics, when now favorable Wolverine was introduced. Luwald got explicit permission to run wild with the series' darker themes. Number 13, nevertheless, Lee still showed great interest in the series, attended all of the initial meetings, and gave producers notes on 10 or 11 of the first season's completed storyboards. Once he became assured that the team got the X-Men world, he simply disappeared, kinda like a Marvel Mary Poppins. Number 14, Lewald read the entire 30 years worth of X-Men comics to become intimately familiar with the characters. To help him out, many of the crew were also intense comic book and or X-Men experts, including director-producer Will Minou, producer Larry Houston, and writer
writer Bob Skur. Number 15, actually both Houston and Manu wrote comics for Marvel before taking on roles on the television series. Number 16, the writers didn't limit themselves to the comics in their hunt for material. They also used the material available in the early Marvel Universe summary books and even an X-Men game booklet. Number 17, Marvel was consistently involved in the series. They were deep into the process for the first few months and then backed off as the series progressed and they learned to trust the show's producers. They would only give notes about smaller mistakes such as instances of characterization. Number 18, while planning season one, Marvel greatly influenced which characters wound up in the core group of X-Men. Everyone agreed on the obvious, Professor X, Wolverine, Cyclops, Jean Grey, and the like, but Marvel pushed for some of the lesser known characters such as Jubilee and Gambit, the latter of whom had only just premiered in the comics in 1990. Number 19, since day one, Luwald knew that having a core roster of characters was crucial to the series. Instead of getting easily sidetracked by the dozens of enticing potential X-Men candidates, the team had to keep the core group to seven or eight for the show to work. Number 20, at the time, the X-Men comics were divided into the blue team and the gold team. The series lineup bears the most resemblance to the blue team, which included Cyclops, Wolverine, Beast, Psylocke, Gambit, Rogue, and Jubilee. Unfortunately, Psylocke was cut, and Jean Grey and Storm were transferred from the gold team. Team. Number 21, the character's design and series overall look was deeply influenced by Stan Lee's artwork from the original X-Men comic series. Number 22, Houston was in charge of the series' general look. When Houston moved from comic books to television, he became deeply inspired by the visual storytelling style of Hayao Miyazaki and regularly applied Miyazaki-inspired techniques to the X-Men. Number 23, brothers Mark and Michael Edens, friends of Lou Waltz from college, were the two writers who had the heaviest hand in developing the initial arc. The Eden brothers had also written episodes for the beloved early 90s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, Tailspin, and the real Ghostbusters. Number 24, as a general rule, if the X-Men writer came up with a premise, he or she would write the outline and then the script. However, since the first season was one giant story arc, Lou Wald, the Eden Brothers, and the other writers worked on the stories together. Number 25, while the team worked diligently to keep the spirit of the books, especially with Marvel breathing down their necks, the majority of the 76 episodes were actually new stories for the series. Both the X-Men crew and Marvel also realized early on that 22-minute animated stories are a very different animal from comic books. All of the actual action in a comic may only take three to four minutes on a TV show. Hey everyone, taking a quick break to let you know about a new show that we're excited about. It's called Science, and we're going to be taking a look at some of our favorite cartoons through a scientific lens. A yellow sea creature that looks like a dish sponge has a pet snail that lives in a pineapple that never rots. His best friend is a dim-witted pink starfish who somehow has a driver's license. And they all live in a city under the sea 3,350 miles northeast of Australia called Bikini Bottom. So exactly why does Bikini Bottom defy the natural world? Let's nerd out a little bit. So this coming Tuesday on Channel Frodo we're going to be talking about the science of SpongeBob. If that's something that sounds like it's up your alley, you should totally check it out and let us know what you think. <laughs> and with that, back to your show. Number 26, for this reason, they realized longer series of books lent themselves more to this adaptation. But then you bump into the classic storybook problem where you have to cut out secondary plots. Luwald estimates that about 50% of the original Phoenix arc was trimmed away in the show in order to focus on the core story. Fact number 27, the most notable arcs borrowed from the comic books included the Phoenix Saga, Days of Future Past, and the Legacy Virus. Days of Future Past may seem like a total given now, but remember, the live action movie totally stole from the animated series Thunder. Number 28, especially when this show is being made, many animated series farmed out writers instead of developing episodes in a shared writer's room. But for X-Men, Luwald had the liberty to conceive arcs, bounce ideas off individual writers, take those back to Marvel, and pieced together a serialized show that felt like a comic book. Number 29, many of Fox's executives were a little freaked out by the X-Men in its planning stages. They believe the series could be a serious flock because those scripts weren't funny and were a little dark. However, after the first screening of the series, all of those anxious executives were conspicuously silent. Number 30, the first round of casting for the X-Men series was absolutely disastrous. Iwanter said the actors sounded like a group of amateurs from high school. I did something I had never done before and have never done since, I fired everyone. Number 31, in the aftermath of the massive firing, Karen Gora, the casting director for the series, offered to try the Toronto theater community, which if you weren't aware, was lauded as second only to the New York theater community in terms of quality of actors and actresses. Iwanter loved the idea since he deeply believed that those stories are worthy of actors, not personalities. So many of the animated series actors are therefore major Shakespearean actors, including Cedric Smith, who played Professor X, and David Hemblin, who played Magneto. 
window. Number 32, Storm was among one of the most difficult roles for the team to cast, along with Wolverine and Professor X. Apparently, Gambit, Magneto, Cyclops, and Beast were all relatively easy in comparison. Number 33, it's not surprising then that the team continued to treat the voice cast, not surprising then that the team sniffs. Voice actress Allison Court remembers that during her first season, multiple execs from across Fox, Marvel, and Saban Entertainment were present. Everyone wanted to have a say, she said. Everyone had their own vision of each character, how they should sound, what level of intensity and seriousness should be. It was unlike any other animated series that had come before. Number 34, Cathal J. Dodd made his debut as Wolverine in the series, although he would continue to play the character in the Spider-Man series and in Marvel video games until 2000. Before X-Men, he was, you guessed it, a jazz singer? Number 35, Beast was voiced by George Buza, who, like Dodd, continued to voice Beast in a few video games. He also played Dubar in The Adventures of Sinbad and starred in the somewhat faded from memory Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the TV series. Number 36, as it turns out, Marvel didn't vote for Beast and the character wasn't initially a part of the team. But the writers loved the character, so naturally they got him arrested so he could just be a part of the show. Their interest in Beast never waned, so they struck an agreement with Marvel by the end of season one. Number 37, Beast is a very well-read individual. He often quotes classic literary works throughout the show and is often seen reading famous novels. In Enter Magneto, he is seen reading Animal Farm by George Orwell. To keep with the whole Shakespearean actor vibe for the casting, in some episodes he quotes both The Merchant of Venice and The Tempest. Number 38, Norm Spencer played Cyclops. On the heels of X-Men, he landed the part of Drax in Loesch's long-awaited Silver Surfer series. He also had a minor 14-year stint as Billy Blazes in Rescue Heroes. Number 39, English-born actor Cedric Smith, who won the Gemini Award for playing Alex King in Avalonia, voiced Professor X, the wise British leader. <laughs> Classic. Number 40, Lenore Zan played Rogue. She may have also invaded your animation childhood as Tigra in the short lived Avengers TV show, Lorca in Dragon Tales, and Shakara Shisho on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. She was chosen for the role because she provided a sexy husky voice with a southern accent. Number 41, Luwald and his team pushed for Rogue because they felt her inability to touch held an emotional draw. They also believed that her flight and strength helped in big fights. Number 42, Chris Potter voiced Gambit. He also starred in one of the most beloved films of all time. I am, of course, talking about Vin Diesel's The Pacifier. Number 43, during the first few voice sessions, execs couldn't make up their minds at how thick Gambit's accent should be. They asked Potter to give a really strong accent at first, and then asked him to take it down a bit, and then bring it back up until finally they reduced it to extremely subtle. Number 44, Catherine Disher provided the voice of Jean Grey, and surprise surprise, continued to voice the character in video games until the early 2000s. She also played Jill in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, Mamet in Sailor Moon, and the mom in Roly Polioli, which was one of the cutest shows on the entire planet. Number 45, the animation studio Graz wanted to change Jean Grey's hairstyle from the current duo in the comic books. It was a weirdly large debate. Even Stan Lee weighed in. Number 46, everyone agreed that the series needed a kid. Despite being such a huge part of the comic books, Marvel voted to ditch Kitty Pride in favor of Jubilee. Number 47, at the show's start, Jubilee didn't have a whole lot more history with the X-Men than Gambit. She first premiered in Uncanny X-Men in 1989. Even then, she was a minor character, and her rise to popularity had the animated series entirely to thank. Number 48, Allison Court voiced Jubilee, although she was actually brought in as a replacement. Court had just worked with Awanter when she played Lydia Dietz on Beetlejuice, and when it came time to cast Jubilee, Awanter said, I don't care who plays Jubilee as long as it isn't Allison Court, because he was so sick of hearing her voice as Lydia. Other forces won out because they believed she could carry on the seriousness of the role against Dodd. Number 49, Allison Seely Smith was the voice of Storm in the animated series. For any Disney fans, she plays Miss Man in Naturally Sadie. She was also one of the many X Men cast members to move on to Silver Surfer, where she had a stint as Gamora. Number 50, within the first few weeks of recording sessions, execs went through a list of at least five different actresses for Storm. Needless to say, this made the other voice actors feel a little uneasy. One of the main reasons Luwald wanted to include Storm was simply because her weather powers were great for TV. Number 51, Morph is voiced by Ron Rubin, who is also the voice of Artemis in Sailor Moon, a Care Bear, and Vision in Avengers United They Stand. Where do they stand exactly? Number 52, Morph is yet another X-Men whose presence in the books is rather minor compared compared to their television personas. And if you scour the old X-Men archives for Morph, you wouldn't find him. His name in the comics is actually Changeling, but alas, DC had trademarked that name for one of their own. Number 53, Morph wasn't originally going to be among the core cast. Au contraire, Luwald added him specifically to have a sympathetic figure killed in the opening. 
Number 54, Luwald and Awanter fought broadcast standards for around a month in order to get the green light to kill Morph. However, Luwald had to promise that if standards and practices let him kill Morph now, he would eventually bring him back to life. Plus, it turns out the character was rather popular. Number 55, you may have noticed now that X-Men the Animated Series boasted a number of kick-ass ladies, and had a number of female writers on staff as well. Luwald said that certain forces were resistant to the gender equality, saying, this is for boys, don't have any girl characters. Loesch was a huge reason that these petty complaints were pushed to the side. Number 56, Fox only ordered 13 episodes for the first season, which is pretty standard for a network show, but also explains why the season really wraps up in those final episodes. No one on the team or at Fox was sure the series was going to be successful enough to be renewed, and many feared it would be a flat-out fail. The show faced a lot of pressure to be funnier and younger. Number 57, Saban Entertainment was the animation studio in charge of getting the show made. They then subcontracted the episodes to Graz Entertainment, who housed scripts, storyboards, and all the like. Graz would then send their product over to the Korean production house, Acom. And after a few weeks, Acom would send the animation back over to Saban to add sound and music. Number 58, Acom's list of credits is not to be scoffed at, especially for 90s kids. They worked on well over 250 episodes of The Simpsons, as well as Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain, Tiny Toon Adventures, The Land Before Time, and Earthworm Jim, among others. Number 59, the entire process from script to final animation usually took up to 20 weeks, and that's not even including the addition of dialogue, music, and effects. Number 60, the X-Men animated series took significantly longer to produce than the Batman animated series because of the increased number of characters characters, which would have been more than enough of a reason for the extra production time, but they also had to tout a vast number of colors in the show as well. Let's face it, Batman wasn't the brightest guy. <laughs> Just kidding, he was totally super smart. Number 61, and for that reason, so many suns set and rose before the X-Men writers could actually review a final product. The team would sometimes write 13 or 26 or even 40 episodes of the series, depending on the order for the season, before they saw how or even if their animated scripts worked. Number 62, too, because Fox Kids was a new channel and Marvel's pockets weren't very deep in the early 90s, X-Men was on a relatively tight budget. Batman ended up having higher quality animation because Warner Brothers was able to literally pour money into it, about $150,000 to $200,000 per episode, which is nowhere near what our humble mutant friends were getting for their show. Number 63, X-Men was originally supposed to premiere over Labor Day weekend in September. Due to production delays, it was pushed to the end of October. When the animation team at Acom turned in the first episode, it contained hundreds of animation animation errors, which Acom refused to fix. Because of the time constraints, the episode was aired with every single error. Number 64, if that wasn't bad enough, the second episode was turned in just before the deadline, with about 50 scenes missing and only a single day reserved for editing. The Night of the Sentinels two-part episode was therefore originally aired as a sneak preview on October 31st. Number 65, and because of these production delays and animation errors, Fox threatened to sever Acom's contracts. With Batman, they would actually go through with it. Number 66, when Fox Fox re-aired the X-Men pilot in early 1993, errors in these episodes were corrected. And despite all those execs biting their nails in anxiousness, the series earned top ratings throughout its first season and was renewed for a second season of 13 more episodes. Number 67, X-Men's success was actually rather dazzling. It finished as the number one children's show only after six weeks on the air. It even faced off against Saved by the Bell and ranked number two among teens since it did incredibly well with teenage boys. Number 68, even the more worrisome aspects of production worked out for the show as well. Those production delays actually helped X-Men since it was airing new episodes, while other networks were cycling through reruns. Number 69, and in case you, like myself, are wondering at this point how exactly the series compares to the comics, it's lauded as being a fairly faithful, albeit toned down, adaptation. Number 70, the theme was written by Ron Wasserman, who also helped set the tone for your 90s childhood by writing the theme for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Number 71, the theme song was picked out from about 16 different options which ranged in genre from heavy metal to commercial TV jingles. Their choice ultimately played into the desire to skew to older viewers. Number 72, when X-Men made it over to Japan in the mid-90s, it included a completely different opening theme and animation. Wasserman's theme was replaced by the more all-out rock song Rising by Ambiance, and the sequence definitely looks way, way more like an anime. Number 73, Luwald chose the Sentinels for season one because their incredible power allowed the writing staff to put the X-Men in their crosshairs. It also allowed the writers to cheat the censors. You can dismember a robot's arm, just not a human's. Number 74, Awanter praises Avery Coburn, his production standards and practices rep 
to no end. Every script for every show had to pass through broadcast standards and practices, so they have incredible power. They could even enhance or destroy an episode. And while Awanter describes previous early 90s reps as having the sense of humor as a rusty door trap, Coburn allowed the X-Men's writing to flourish. Number 75, Enter Magneto was inspired by the comics, specifically X-Men's 1963 debut with Uncanny X-Men number 1. In the comics, it's the X-Men's first day of class and Marvel's own summary says Magneto wants to make it a memorable one, and their last. Wouldn't those two be mutually exclusive though? Number 76, Magneto names the leader of his mutates Sauron. Of course, this is a nod to the Lord of the Rings, where Gandalf leads an army against the forces of Sauron. In an interesting coincidence, both the live-action Magneto and Gandalf were played by Sir Ian McKellen. See what they did there? Number 77, Sauron was created as a way of sidestepping the comics code authority, which, for some reason, wouldn't let you have a vampire in a comic. Most people think that Sauron is all-powerful, but Neil Adams, Sauron's creator, describes him as an energy vampire. He couldn't have Sauron turn into a bat because it'd be a dead giveaway, so what's similar to a bat? A pterodactyl. Duh. Number 78, Magneto is played by David Hemblin, another Canadian catch who trained at the Royal Alexandra Theatre. As far as cartoon goes, he also plays as Modius in Redwall. Number 79, one of the trademark sounds of the show was that kind of zapping noise that accompanied Magneto's magnetism powers, which is why the cloaking device on the Klingon ship in Star Trek III The Search for Spock may have rightfully sounded familiar to you. Number 80, in the original comic story of Days of Future Past, the time traveler is Kitty Pride, who actually doesn't appear in this series at all. She is instead replaced by Bishop, who doesn't appear in the original story. Number 81, Bishop was actually added at Fox's behest. The network was very conscious about diversity and wanted the series to include strong characters of color without being intrusive or obvious about the addition. Number 82, during this episode of X-Men, one of the gravestones that Wolverine sees is marked Jubilee 2010. In a fascinating co-coincidence, Jubilee in the comic actually technically died in 2010 as well, when she was turned into a vampire during that year's Curse of the Mutants crossover. Number 83, for season 2, the writing team was asked to make more standalone episodes so that returns can go out in any order. Sneaky as ever, Luwald skirted the request through multi-episode arcs and the one-minute end segments with Xavier and Magneto in the Savage Land. Not in the main story if it's at the end, I guess. Number 84, the show's team intended to have Cyclops and Jean Grey get married in the second season, but Bob Harris, the show's Marvel intermediary, convinced them to hold off so that the characters could get married in the comics. And they did, three years later. Number 85, Luol believes that Beast is the most at ease with and reconciled to his mutancy, despite being the strangest looking member of the principal X-Men. Caring for someone who has never seen him but would soon seemed like the perfect setup to explore his character. Thus was the creation of the episode Beauty and the Beast, wherein Beast falls for a blind girl who then regains her sight, which was thought up by Luol's wife, Julia. Number 86, the first two seasons were serialized, but after the Phoenix Saga, the show started sending out episodes to different animation studios, and the returns were out of chronology. Instead of waiting to piece together the story, Fox released them as soon as they were finished, with the exception of multi-parters. Number 87, some episodes even aired years after their intended due date. One prime example is No Mutant is an Island, which was intended to set up Jean Grey's return after the Season 3 Phoenix Saga and hint at the Dark Phoenix Saga in 1994. However, the episode ended up airing in 1996. Number 88, X-Men crossed over with the animated series Spider-Man, a series that it totally opened the door for. In Mutant Agenda, Spider-Man seeks out the X-Men's help to stave off his progressing mutation. Number 89, the sign outside of the warehouse at the beginning of Cold Comfort reads Kirby Glenn, Storage Depot number 1917. This is a reference to Jack Kirby, the co-creator of the X-Men comics, alongside Lee, and 1917 was the year of his birth. Number 90, Tara Strong, known for her roles as Timmy Turner, Twilight Sparkle, and Raven from Teen Titans, had a four-episode stint on the show as Alana Rasputin. Back then, though, she was credited as Tara Charendoff. Number 91, although the episode is a favorite of Loesch's, the Nightcrawler episode got a lot of internal resistance for its treatment of God. Broadcasts and standards in particular were deeply skeptical. This kind of episode was unheard of for a kid's show. Number 92, Eric Luwald wrote Deal with the Devil from start to finish by himself. Generally, he was a polisher or an idea man, but in this case, Marvel had paid a writer for the script and ended up tossing it out. So, since there was no money for another writer, Luwald had to do one for free. Number 93, the Beyond Good and Evil arc, was actually written to be the end of the series at a nice round 65 episodes, but then Fox ordered 11 additional scripts. Number 94, Fox's episode orders were rather irregular. These episodes were broken up into different seasons, which in order consisted of 13, 
39, another 13, 6, and then 5 episodes. Number 95, the last few episodes look a little different than the rest of the series. Aside from the I thought we ended this factor, this was also because they were funded directly by Saban rather than Marvel. It's hard to believe, but Marvel was actually busy filing for bankruptcy at the time. Number 96, the final episode, Graduation Day, aired on September 20th, 1997, which ended the show's five-year run. The episode was specifically written to be the end of the series, again. Number 97, X-Men Adventures was a comic book spin-off of the animated series beginning in November of 1992. In 1996, the series was revamped and became Adventures of the X-Men for 12 issues before being cancelled entirely. Number 98, the series was also responsible for its fair share of video games including X-Men, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse, X-Men 2 Clone Wars, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, and the X-Men vs. Capcom series. Number 99, Margaret Loesch is behind all things X-Men, so naturally she was the one to pitch an X-Men movie to the Fox feature group after the series ended. And we all know that Fox took the bait. Fact number 100, the films owe a lot to the animated series. In fact, Eric Lawald and Will Munyar were brought on as consultants for the first film script. Number 101, remember how Lewald read 30 years of comic books to prepare for the show? His work allowed the director of the 2000 film, Brian Singer, to avoid now 40 years of comic books just by binge-watching all 76 episodes of X-Men the Animated Series. Number 102, David Hemblin, the voice of Magneto, was the first man offered the live-action role for the 2000 film, but he turned it down due to scheduling conflicts with the series Earth, Final Conflict. At least we got Gandalf Magneto out of this loss. Number 103, George Buza, the voice actor for Beast, actually did make it into the first film, albeit briefly. He played a trucker. Number 104, the inspiration to cast actors such as Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen as Xavier and Magneto is suspiciously similar to the show's casting of Toronto stage actors and Shakespearean folk. Ewanter mused, I wonder where they got that idea from. Number 105, while the series ended in 1997, the success of the first live-action X-Men movie in 2000 inspired Fox to re-air the arcs related to the film. Later, the series was just aired in its entirety and moved homes from Fox to ABC Family and Toon Disney. Number 106, the show's legacy lives well beyond the films. X-Men, along with the Batman series, helped spawn the superhero cartoon boom. X-Men specifically paved the way for more Marvel Universe shows during the 90s, including Spider-Man, The Fantastic Four, Hulk, and Iron Man. And fact number 107, a new comic book called X-Men 92 was released in summer 2015. The series picks up where X-Men the animated series left off, making it more or less an official spin-off of the series. Thanks for watching the 107 facts you should know about X-Men the animated series. Which mutant is your favorite? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you like what you just saw, then check out some of the other 107 fact videos that we have here on Channel Frederator by clicking the annotations. And be sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator so you don't miss out on any of our videos because remember, Frederator loves you. Hello guys, I love your videos. Can you guys do 107 facts about Digimon Digital Monsters? Thank you, I really like that show.